What's up guys, Jake here with a quick message before we get on to our show. Please make sure that you like this video below, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, and also make sure that you sign up for notifications. With your guys' help, we can ensure that all of the guests get the right attention and audience that they deserve. I thank all of you guys for joining me along this very adventurous journey, and now let's get on to the show. Welcome in, everybody. You are now joining George Chanos on the guest list. So I'm very excited for this conversation, I have to say. George is the chairman of the popular sandwich shop Capriati's. He was the 31st attorney general in Nevada under Kenny Gwynn, and he is an author of two books. It is Seize Your Destiny and the most recent one, Millennial Samurai, which I did actually read in preparation for this conversation. Amazing book. George, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, and thank you for reading Millennial Samurai. Uh, I have to say, in typical, traditional millennial fashion, you made it free online download. And I was like, oh, this is so applicable for the millennial generation. <laughs> yeah, we've got over 13,000 downloads uh, right now at millennialsamurai.com. And, and as you pointed out, they're free. Um, you, can, you can buy the book on Amazon if you prefer a hard copy, but the, uh, the, the digital version is available for free on uh, millennialsamurai.com. It was a great read, and I would actually like to start off with that, and then we can maybe uh, reverse Benjamin Button back to your history after this, because sure. the book's very fresh in my mind, and the majority of my listeners are all millennials. I think it's like 70% is 40 and under, and it's about 60, 40 men to women. And uh, I, I like how you had how you wrote this book. Uh, first off, there's it's easy, digestible chapters they're about like three to five pages with like about 180 different sections but you started it very like internally and it starts with like the millennial perspective and some of the different tangibles and qualities and principles that you need and then by the end of the book you're talking about ai and blockchain and uh, living forever and all these different facets of what we have to prepare for what what inspired you to target the millennial generation and to to write the book in this manner? Well, first of all, um, my daughter and my nephew um, are both millennials. And, um, you know, I remember growing up um, when I was uh, uh, younger, I was one of the baby boomer generation. And at the time of the baby boomer uh, phenomenon, we were the largest generation in history, 80 million of us, and all anybody was talking about was the baby boomers, right? And there's a reason for that, because when you have an 80 million um, uh, consumer segment um, that is going to mature over time, every corporation, every advertiser is focused on that new emerging consumer base, right? So that's where they want to put their attention. Well, the millennials are 85 million strong, right? So they're larger than the baby boomers. And today, that's where the world's focus is. It's on the millennial generation. Um, regardless of, of what, you, what anybody says about the millennial generation, um, they will be at the tip of the spear as humanity encounters what I see as a technological tsunami that's going to hit uh, not only the United States, but the world. And um, so we need to empower. I believe that it's incumbent upon my generation to download whatever knowledge we have before we pass to this new generation of leaders that are going to lead humanity into the 21st century. And um, it's not that it's all going to be on millennials. You've got Gen Z coming behind you. You've got alphas coming behind them. And you know, there's, there's going to be this train of humanity that uh, is going to be dealing with everything that's coming, but you, your generation is going to be at the tip of the spear. So that's, that's one reason. The other reason is my daughter, my nephew, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to advise them, right? So I've, we'll probably dig into this more later, but I've been advising people for 30 years. I've made a living out of it, quite a good living out of it. And, um, you know, it's what, it's what I do, it's my strength. And so um, I'm, I'm simply leveraging my skill set that I've developed over the last 30 years 
to take a look at the next 30 years and analyze what that's going to look like and what challenges that will reveal and what skill sets are required to survive and thrive in that new environment and advise my daughter and my nephew and the 85 million millennials on what they need to know to you know, have success, have happiness, whatever they're, um, however they define success, I don't presume to define success for them. Um, you know, for some, it might be working for Greenpeace. For some, it might be working for Google. Um, for some, it might be creating, um, you know, either of those types of, of uh, endeavors. Um, but the idea is that, that at 62, I'm 62. So at my age, um, it's all about legacy for me. Um, I've, you know, I've been there and done that in terms of accomplishing my goals. I've, uh, I've satisfied my financial requirements pretty much for the rest of my life. And, um, and so now I'm focused on legacy. I'm focused on leaving a contribution and trying to uh, live a life that is purposeful and that matters. And, um, and I believe that impacting other people's lives and empowering other people is one of the greatest things that I can do um, to leave as my legacy. And so that's, that's what I'm in, embarked on today. Well, first, uh, I tip my cap off to you for realizing first that you've hit your, your financial goals and that you want to give back because it seems like, and, and in your book, you actually touch on a lot of these different things that are happening at this moment. But right now, it seems like the big conflict between millennials and, and the baby boomers of your generation is that the baby boomers, they don't have um, a set amount of monetary value that they want to gain. Like they just keep pushing it and pushing it. And like, yeah. and now they kind of just keep that power um, within themselves. And that's what you see with politics and corporations. And that creates a lot of angst and anxiety for the millennials, because as you said, we're about to take over and have like the largest amount of purchasing power, but they're not going to have any any money to to utilize that purchasing power to begin with. So, I, like I said, I applaud you for doing that because with people like you and like minded of your generation to give back to us, it's what's going to be required for us to succeed and implement a lot of these different strategies and technologies and and mindsets in your book. Yeah. Well, one of I mean, one of our biggest failings um, as human beings is that we we always want more. Um, it's, 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 it's a blessing and a curse. Um, in one sense, it drives us um, and causes us to build, um, build societies, build empires, um, that drive of wanting more. Um, and, and in the other sense, it causes us to become a very effluent as opposed to affluent society um, where we're wasteful. I mean, um, you go into a restaurant and they ser serve you an oversized meal where half of it ends up in the trash is a very um, wasteful, you know, type of behavior. Um, you know, our strip mining of, of our natural resources, our, our oil drilling, um, our pipeline laying, you know, all the things that we're doing in the world today to consume resources that, you know, cutting down uh, Amazon rainforests, all of the things that we're doing um, to have more and more and more um, is not necessarily uh, beneficial to, you know, to us and to future generations. And I think it's actually very reckless um, and short-sighted. And so, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I do believe that, uh, um, I do believe that, that we as human beings are put here for a purpose. Um, I don't know what that purpose is. I think we all find our own, um, but I certainly don't believe that I'm an accident and that I'm just, you know, a speck of dust that's here. I, I believe that I'm here for some reason. And, uh, and you know, I've, uh, in the absence of knowing exactly what that reason is, I've chosen the reason to be helping others. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I think that's a pretty good reason. I'm sad, it's a reason I'm at least satisfied with. Yeah, like I said, I, I enjoyed the book and you touched on a lot of these different points. Um, in terms of how we kind of overcome this mindset uh, of greed and it's kind of just built into our evolutionary evolutionary standards and biology, what is the what is what would be the the priority track to kind of overcome this this mindset? Is it something in terms of like education? Do we kind of go, do we have to 
fix the the political realm? Do we go, is it the fastest track through some sort of technology? Uh, what would you say is like the the priority to, to overcome this? Well, first of all, I, I'd say that millennials are way ahead of everyone in terms of, of uh, having the right mindset. Um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, this is the thing that they're criticized for, right? The, 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 uh, the whole um, range of criticism about millennials is generally that they're not embracing the values of the prior generation of baby boomers, right? And I don't see that as a weakness. I see that as an awareness. I see that as a strength. And, um, you know, they're the most technologically advanced generation. They're the most uh, globally networked generation. They're the most ethnically diverse generation. 40% of millennials are religi religiously unaffiliated. 40% um, of them, um, you know, value life experience over, over money. Um, the, um, forget who it was, uh, the Pew, Pew uh, Research did a study that said that um, uh, something like 40% of millennials would rather make, um, I believe it was around $40,000 than at a job that they found fulfilling than $100,000 at a job that they found boring or, um, um, something that they didn't believe in. Um, and so the, the quality of life is, is, is something that they value much more than work. And that wasn't our priority. Our priority was work. Um, so how do you change that mindset? Um, uh, you're, you're probably you know, in a better position to tell me how your generation <laughs> has evolved into that more enlightened mindset um, than, than my generation. Um, I think that, that a lot of the answers that we're looking for relate back to the human brain. And so I've been doing some work studying the human brain and trying to learn more about it. And I'm by no means an expert, but um, we've learned more about the human brain in the last five years than in the last 5,000 years. And we're going to learn a vast amount more. And, and the more we, you know, it's interesting because if I were to give you a car, you know, um, it would come, or, or even a VCR, it would come with some kind of training. It would come with some kind of owner's manual, right? But, but your brain comes with nothing, mm. right? So you have to figure out how, it, how that operating system actually works, right? And when you find out more about how that operating system works, it, it reveals a great deal about human interaction, about why we make decisions, about why we have the priorities that we do. Um, our brains are sort of like hardware, right? So we are, we're all given a certain set of hardware and give or take, it's substantially similar, right? Your brain might be a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, uh, but generally speaking, it is, it is a very similar hardware configuration that each human being has in, uh, by virtue of their brain. The difference is, is, is that we all have very different software, right? So the software is your life experience, right? Mm -hmm. Your life experience is very different than my life experience, right? You grew up in a different home. You grew up in you know, perhaps a different city. You listened to different music. You, you know, were surrounded by different friends and influences. Uh, the media that you consumed was different than the media that I consumed. And so all of this created the software that, that resides within your brain. And so now when you see the world, when your brain sees the world, it sees the world through that prism, that, that, that software that you've created throughout the course of your life. And because your prism is different than my prism, it's natural that you would see the world differently, right? So we're all going to see the world differently. The Talmud talks about this, saying that, um, um, uh, what, is, what is it, the quote exactly? Um, something to the effect of, um, we see the world, we see the world not as it is, but as we are, right? And, and there's, there's, there's so many of these ancient truths that, that really, you know, are imparting actual truth, 
right? We do in fact see the world, not as it is. We see it as we are. And so it's important to understand that. And so, you know, that's why millennials are seeing the world a little differently because they are different. Their brains are different. Their software is different. Their life experience has been different, right? Um, you've grown up in, in, in a technological era. Um, I did not grow up in a technological era. That's, that's a night and day difference, right? Um, one of the things that I've noticed about your generation is that they're more impatient, right? Now, why, why are they more impatient, right? They wanna be, they wanna be much further ahead, much faster, right? Um, you know, why are they impatient? Well, when I wanted to know something, I'd have to get on my bike, <laughs> I'd have to drive <laughs> to the library, right? And I'd have to find a book and I'd have to read it, right? And today you just go on your cell phone and you're able to Google something instantaneously and get an answer right then and there. So that has created uh, an expectation of immediacy, right? And, and so of course you're gonna be more impatient, right? Because you know, you, you, things come to you pretty quickly in, in the technological age. So I, I think that, that the way that you think is shaped by what you've experienced. And, um, and it's, it's just gonna be very fascinating to see where this all goes. But um, my contribution and, and, and my generation's contribution, I think needs to be, you know, we can learn something from every prior generation. Right? So there are certain things, certain ancient truths, for example, that have allowed every generation in human history to succeed, right? So commitment, right? Or courage or compassion, right? Or the ability to communicate. These are things that, that are applicable no matter what generation you're from, right? And so, you know, these are things that I wanna make sure we download from our life experience into, into your minds and then uh, empower you to the greatest extent possible to be everything that you can and to do as much as you can for humanity. I, I like that, that metaphor of software being your experiences in life because how they always say that millennials, we are an experience-based economy, right? We're, we're all going to music festivals, we're taking trips with our friends, um, we're I, even, fine dining is now all about the experience because they realize that that's what we focus on. Maybe because we, we focus on these experiences with our friends so that maybe we can build this software together and we can all kind of be on the same page because there's been a, a lot of suffering. And something I, I echo on here a lot is like Vegas specifically has been built on entrepreneurism, right? It gets a lot of flack for being the bottom tier and educational standards, but but what's not a statistic is the amount of money you can go make on the strip, and then the amount of businesses and different passion projects that people go do in Vegas. It's crazy. Like I had Michael Naft on here, who's the Clark County Commissioner in, in the Henderson area, and he said that there was fifty thousand LLCs um, in that one area. You know, so it comes down down to an average of about one in twenty people, maybe even less than that. So it shows that like our generation and, you know, it could be some of the older people as well. Like they're trying to, to build new experiences and build some new infrastructure through the, this kind of software adaptation. So I, I think that when it comes to experiences and software, one millennials are very aware of this I actually just had on a man, a few episodes before you, who's running an AI recruiting firm. And he told me a stat that the, the average, um, the average time span of a job held for a millennial is 18 months. And yeah. then they, they tend to tend to move on to a different spot after that because they either realize there's no upwards movement or their, their perspective has changed and they're not really focused on, on the money as much per se because there's so many different opportunities out there by the way that we connect with each other. Yeah, there's, there's uh, um, another interesting um, kind of example about how you can think about certain things. Um, I was reading something the other day that was talking about um, how looking at a problem backwards um, can be very enlightening. Um, for example, reading, proofreading a document from um, end to beginning rather than from beginning to end. Proofreading a document from end to beginning, line by line, 
will allow you to catch more grammatical errors and more spelling mistakes, mm. right? So you'll see the picture more clearly um, by taking this reverse route, right? Um, and you can do the same thing by um, examining a failure, for example, right? If you had a failure, let's say you went through a series of steps, you tried to build a business, you tried to uh, form a relationship, whatever it is that you were engaged in trying to do, and you're puzzled as to, you know, why this happened the way that it did, um, it can be helpful to go to the end and then work back sequentially in the events as they unfolded in reverse. And it'll give you a new insight, a different insight into um, the, uh, um, the issue that you're examining. And, and how that relate, how, how I find, found that really kind of uh, um, profound is because um, my life philosophy was, was um, sort of based on that um, approach. Um, there was a point where I was at the, at the deathbed of someone I cared about very much and um, uh, they were older and, um, and when they were dying, I, I knew that the, the night that I was with them that they were going to pass. I knew that it would happen either that night or the next day. And I thought to myself, what is it that's going through their mind, right? And I thought, well, they're probably playing their life back, right? They're probably playing their life back like a movie and, and thinking about the life that they led, right? And so I thought, well, you know, one day I'm going to be on that deathbed, right? And so what do I want to be thinking about as I'm lying on that deathbed? And I thought, well, what I want to be thinking about is I don't want to have a lot of regrets, right? Yes, I, don't, yes. I don't want to be thinking about all the things that I wish I would have done, right? Or that I would have done differently. Um, and so I decided at that time, to live my life backwards to forwards, that I would live my life with that philosophy of trying to create a life for myself, that upon that moment, I would have as few regrets as possible, right? And so, um, you know, there are some interesting ways we kind of conceptualize things. And for me, that's been very helpful, um, a very helpful and healthy perspective, um, because if I spent the next however many years I had chasing more money um, and, and that was my focus, I would be regretful. I would be on that deathbed saying, you know, what did I do that for? You know, I, I already had this amount of money. I, I didn't need this extra amount of money. And, and why did I spend those 10 years chasing uh, the, you know, the additions to my bank account um, or, you know, an extra, you know, pair of shoes or clothes or, or cars or, or this or that, um, when I could have been enriching my life in different ways, um, that I would, you know, be playing back these fabulous memories about my time in Lisbon and, you know, my time in Costa Rica yes. and, you know, all these experiences that, that I've had and, and, and will yet have. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, my life philosophy is, is it's similar to a millennial philosophy in it that um, I want more experience. Um, I value experience. I value freedom. Um, I could be doing all sorts of things today, right? Uh, as a former attorney general, I, I, would, I would be expected to be a senior partner at a major law firm, right? Why am I not doing that? That would make the most money, right? And uh, that's the most natural um, path for me. Um, and yet I left the practice of law. I left politics and the practice of law and decided to do other things, right? And it's all about experience, right? So um, yeah, yeah. maybe I'm a millennial that was born <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Honestly, there's so many directions I could take that, but I'm so ecstatic that you talked about reverse engineering your life because as early as I can remember since middle school, I had this fascination with reading essays of older people who were into their late 70s and 80s reflecting on their life. And the one piece of information I found throughout dozens of different essays was that a lot of 
a lot of times they're looking back and the, their first thing is things that they didn't do in their life. And yeah. that kind of really stuck with me as, as I got older and grew up. And that's when I ended up in call after college, I tried to do two, two different businesses. And I've kind of just like tried to attach myself to all these different things. Um, and then I came on to Naval. I'm pretty sure you quoted Naval in, in your book. Are you f- familiar? Yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he talks about specific knowledge and how, um, like it's it's good, you know, it's great to be in the top one percent of whatever field that you're in, but if you could be in the top seventy percent of let's say three to five different industries or fields disciplines, then you could create something so specific to you that nobody else will be able to replicate. And then you find your niche, and then once you find your niche, you're able to find your purpose from from there there on after. And so that kind of thinking and experience really stuck with me because. A lot of times we do get focused on the the dollar denomination of everything, but I mean, come to find out now of today of this recording, Bitcoin just hit 40,000 and a lot of people are really just looking at value differently in today's world. And I I think the denomination of of the dollar is eventually going to go away maybe 20, 30 years from now, but people are starting to value things much differently than just a monetary value. And that's, I've been a big Bitcoin person since 2017. And that completely like shattered my worldview of what value actually is. Because when you start these different businesses, I had two, two fail, quote, quote, failure businesses, you know, I lost some money, but the, the skills and the confidence that I derived from that assisted me in the ability to start this podcast and gain some success. So I, I like that you talk about, you know, different things of value and reverse engineering your life because it really, the experience is really what hits home for both of us. Yeah. Well, interestingly, um, you're going to discover that, that the absolutely um, most significant and greatest teacher in life is failure, mm-hmm. right? So um, you, you have to, you know, life throws you both successes and failures, right? And we all get this combination um, in varying degrees of how much success we experience and how much failure we experience. And if, if all you do is take the successes that you've had and focus on those, right? Um, and, and you let your failures be arrows, right? That are, that are um, injuring you right? Um, imagine if you change your mindset on that and, and you take each one of these arrows and you catch it and, and you look at it and you examine it and you learn from it and you profit from it, right? If you profit from it, then you're both profiting from your successes and you're profiting from your failures and you're enriching yourself um, immeasurably. I mean, um, you know, doubling the value uh, of, of your life because um, you're taking all of these, these benefits out of these failures. I, I, um, I never, uh, um, you know, I, I won't say I never regret failure, but I never miss an opportunity um, to learn from a failure. And, and I'm always, I, I'm a big, big believer that, that there's tremendous opportunity in adversity right? And and that adversity can be a failure that you learn from. That's an opportunity. Um, It can be COVID. It can be, um, you know, what we saw. Uh, You you could take any any failure and talk to me about any failure, and I could tell you um, what the silver lining is, or or I could tell you a silver lining, right? A positive that I see out of that failure, right? Even even the other day, the, the storming of the Capitol, there's a benefit to it. Right there, there's a benefit to it, and that it should act as a wake-up call. Yep. It should alert Congress to the fact that there are some issues here, that you know people are dissatisfied, and that we need to address them. And um, you know, so uh, that's that's a positive of of what happened. There are many negatives uh, to what happened, and we can concentrate and focus on the negatives. But I see no upside in doing that. I, I see upside in examining adversity for what it can do for us, right? In uh, COVID, um, my company, Capriati's, um, experienced double-digit sales growth um, during the last year. 
um, you know, throughout COVID, we went from a, a seller of, of, you know, sandwiches um, that were 50% online sales to today we're 95% online sales, but our sales are higher than they were last year, <laughs> right? Um, double digits higher. Um, and, and not only that, but we pivoted and we went from a, a office that had a hundred people working in it to, um, and, and thousands of, of franchisees and employees, but a, a hundred plus people in the corporate support um, staff. And, and those people are all now online working from their homes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've proven that we can do that. And, and so these are all value adds. We've, we've gone from, um, so, so if you're able to eliminate the rent on office space for 100 people, that's a fantastic you know, situation, right? Um, we've gone into uh, um, ghost kitchens, right? Which is uh, essentially people take a warehouse, someone goes in and develops a warehouse, and they build multiple kitchens in that warehouse, right? Maybe 50, maybe 100 kitchens. And then they rent out, they lease out those kitchens. They could be 200 square feet. And they lease them out to operators that have restaurants, right? So Taco Bell could be in a, in a ghost kitchen right next to Capriati's. Um, you know, any number of, of different restaurant concepts could occupy this industrial warehouse and have their own ghost kitchen, right? And then Uber Eats and DoorDash and and um, Postmates, you know, drive up to the industrial building and they pick up the order that a consumer places online and they, you know, get the food and, and deliver it to the consumer. And the consumer doesn't know whether or not it's coming out of this industrial ghost kitchen or whether or not it's coming out of a inline retail space that's two thousand square feet. As opposed to have an operation that's 2,000 square feet and has 15 employees, right, that are rotating versus you have an operation that's 200 square feet and two employees, right, your economics are night and day, right? So, so even though it's, it's something like COVID that drives you into this new environment, the new environment creates enormous opportunities to plus your your performance, right? So, so we've pivoted very successfully during, during COVID. We've not only done everything I've described, but we, we recently made a, a major acquisition of a company called WingZone and uh, you know, virtually doubled the size of our company during COVID. So um, adversity creates opportunity if you look for it, right? So, so during COVID, there's a lot of restaurant failures, right? There's a lot of people that, that, that are searching for work that are high quality people that you might not have been able to attract yesterday, right? But now they're, they're out of a job and now you're able to attract them, right? So every time there's an opportunity, don't focus on, on how it's injuring you. Focus on how it can elevate you, how it can improve your performance. Um, that's a, an extremely important concept um, for anyone, no matter yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, it is. Uh, there, I think you actually wrote a chapter about this in your book. Uh, it might not have been the exact phrase, but basically, like we live in a society of infinite leverage. You can you can use that leverage in opportunities, in trouble. Um, through a friend, like there's so many different ways that you can find success, but you have to change your perspective and look at it. And uh, I like that you talked about COVID because I've actually said this a bunch of times too, is like COVID is basically been rocket fuel for a lot of these trends that were, that were happening in society. And a lot of them are actually at the end of your book, which are yeah. really coming into fruition. And so it's basically cutting out all of the, the outdated infrastructure in society and really yeah. propelling us into the internet age that everyone has really thought was going to happen in a lot of the, the, the Hollywood movies um, always try to portray. But it's, it's really coming. And with technology and specifically software, it accelerates at a faster pace, like more rapidly sure. and rapidly. So like before, before you, you know it, VR is going to be here and that's going to be the, the next term, form of social media. At least that's my guess. I already see it kind of happening in certain areas. 
And so we have to prepare ourselves. And the best way to do it is, is with the, the sword of mental pre preparedness. Yeah. So, so VR and, and AR and, and, you know, businesses like the one that you're pursuing today, the one that we're engaged mm -hmm. in, um, are going to ex excel in this new environment, right? In, in education, for example, um, education is, is desperately in need of reinvention, right? So, so we created the educational system in the United States at the turn of the industrial revolution, right? To move from an agrarian society to an industrial society. We needed to move people off the farms into the factories and we needed them to be able to read and write. We needed them to be able to operate a machine. And so we created the public education system. Well, that was a hundred plus years ago, right? So now we are moving from the industrial revolution into the technological revolution, right? Which will dwarf the industrial revolution. And yet we haven't changed our education system to conform to the technological revolution or to prepare people for the technological revolution, right? We're still building large sprawling campuses with 50 foot climbing walls and Olympic swimming pools. And, you know, we've got, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people teaching, right? And, um, you know, why do we need, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 250,000 different people teaching algebra? Right? Why, why don't we just pick the best algebra teachers yeah. for each grade and put them online? Right? Why don't we have Elon Musk talking to us online? Why don't we have Jeff Bezos talking to us online? You know, why don't we have all these great thinkers and, and, and people who have accomplished great things in life? Why aren't they speaking to all of our children and to all of us and, and educating us online? You know, why aren't we leveraging and harnessing this amazing technology to create a second enlightenment as opposed to, you know, using it to, uh, um, you know, watch, uh, what's his name, uh, Logan Paul? Or Logan Paul, Paul yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, do fun funky stuff, right? I mean, it's such a, it's such a waste of, of such a powerful technology, right? I mean... Uh, our electoral system, right? We recently went through a challenge, uh, a presidential election where, you know, there's all sorts of claims that have surfaced about uh, election irregularities or, or uh, failures of the system or, you know, fraud within the system, right? We've now got blockchain technology, right? We could do a fully encrypted blockchain system. You could be voting on your computer. You could have a you could have a platform, you guys, you know, your generation, you know, the next Mark Zuckerberg, instead of creating a Facebook that is like Facebook, um, take Facebook and turn it into an instrument of political empowerment, right? So, I mean, every candidate could appear, every candidate could have their own page, they could do fundraising through that platform, they could have all of their media on the platform, uh, media could interact with them live in real time on that platform, all of their credentials and, and articles that have been written about them and community forums could spring up and people could just go online and click on a candidate and they could learn everything that they needed to know, uh, not just what the candidate is telling them, but all the interviews that have been done, all the criticisms that have been levied, um, all of the lawsuits that have been filed against them, all of the bankruptcies that they've, you know, all that stuff could be there, right? And, and you could create this amazingly robust system. People could volunteer on the platform. People could make contributions on the platform. Contributions could be seen in real time on the platform so you'd know where their money's coming from and who's donating it. Um, you could require that all communications with lobbyists be through the platform fully transparent so that you know if, if uh, ExxonMobil is talking to the person, um, they're not doing it at some steakhouse and they're not doing it at some re retreat in Palm Springs. They're doing it on that platform and you're watching the communication as it's yeah. unfolding, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things that we could be doing to improve our lot, right? And, and it will be, you know, it will be incumbent upon your generation um, to do these things. Um, you know, I can help you with some ideas, right? <laughs> um, but, 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 
you know, I wouldn't begin to know how to how to program any of this, mm -hmm. right? I'm I'm not uh, computer literate to the extent that I could build something like this, um, but some kid could build it out of his garage, right? Yeah. And uh, and it could change the world. I mean, it could change the country. Um, so I believe that that will happen. I believe that that's inevitable. Um, I believe that there will be a shift uh, from entertainment towards um, you know, performance and, and value added uh, enterprises. Um, I'm trying to build one right now. I'm, I'm hiring people to try to build a, 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 a program called Limitless. Uh, it's limitlessthinking.com. You could go on it, you can sign up today uh, and register. Um, but essentially it's a learning platform. It's, a, it's an empowerment community, right? It's for people like yourself to, uh, um, it has a number of different facets, right? Um, so we, we learn and we teach and we grow and we develop in communities, right? Whether it is your church or whether it's a fraternity or whether it's a political party or whether it's a religion or whatever it happens to be, we congregate. Um, in fact, uh, Yuval Noah Harari talks about this yeah, in, yes. in Sapiens, that, uh, that as human beings, we are... Um, only really capable of collaborating to about 100 or 150 human beings um, when we don't know each other and we have no connection. But if you all of a sudden are part of the same church or you're part of the same fraternity or you're, bo or you're both Americans, right? I meet you in Munich and you know, we're at a bar and you say, I'm an American. Oh, I'm from Las Vegas. Well, all of a sudden, you know, I can now have a level of confidence in feeling that there's some kind of a connection, some kind of familiarity, some kind of similarity where I'm going to feel more comfortable with you, right? So this is what communities do. And this is what Harari is talking about, right? Um, he refers to them as fictions that, you know, we create these fictions, uh, the fiction of America, the fiction of a corporation, the fiction of, of uh, we're all Green Bay Packer fans. Um, so, uh, these fictions are important for us to move forward, um, with our lives. So Limitless creates that community, right, um, of people that are all trying to better their lives, that are, that are people helping people, right? So the whole idea of this is you join this to network with other people who will help you. And those people are joining because they want to help. They're people like me. They want to help. They want to give back, right? So people from my generation will join because they want to teach or they want to give or they want to contribute. People from your generation will join because they want to receive. They want to contribute. They want to interact. Um, they want to learn. And it will have Zooms. You know, we'll have you on as, as, as a guest and I'll interview you and, and we'll talk about your journey and your business and and through that process, others will learn how you did what you did, right? So that they can follow your path if that's a path that they choose to follow, right? Um, they'll gain inspiration from your experience. They'll learn from your failures because we'll talk about your failures and we'll talk about what you learned from them, right? So just like you're doing where you're empowering the people that are following and watching you interview me, we'll do the same type of thing um, uh, with Zoom interviews. We'll have daily emails, right? So you will receive a daily email. I'm in the process of curating um, 365 emails for a full year. So every day you'll receive a gem, a little gem, which is uh, a, a, um, a, an email that is meant to empower you in some way. So it may teach you about a concept, right? It may contain a link to a study or to a video. Um, but it's something that within five to 10 minutes each day, um, you will benefit from. Just like Millennial Samurai, the 182 chapters, right? Each one of those chapters. Well, instead of three to five pages, this will be um, delivered on your phone on a daily basis in an, in an even more abbreviated format. So less than one page as opposed to three to five pages, right? So less than one page, and you'll be learning about all these new things and all these things that are happening and you'll be gaining this better understanding and then you'll be able to plug into this community and you'll be able to interact with this community online and in real, and, and in life, in real life. Um, we'll have lunches and dinners and conferences and, 
uh, special guests and those types of things. And, and the idea is to, to do it very, very affordably, right? So we're not trying to, it's not a profit, it, it's, a, it's a public benefit corporation. So there's a difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit corporation and a public benefit corporation falls in between. And so it's got a philanthropic uh, component to it, right? That is not profit driven, that is not for profit. And it's got a for-profit component, component that allows it to grow economically and build and expand without constantly having to go out and seeking donations, right? So that's why it's a public benefit corporation. And so we, what we'll do, the idea is to charge a very modest monthly uh, uh, subscription fee, right? And to over deliver value, right? So to deliver a level of value that makes you feel and believe um, that what you are receiving is worth 10X of what you're paying. And, and then go to corporate sponsors and monetize it through corporate sponsors by saying, all right, we're changing lives. We're going to actually transform people's lives over the course of time. And, and here's what we're doing and here's what we're teaching them and here's what we're showing and here's their reaction and here's how they're responding, right? And they're, they're, they're becoming raving disciples. They absolutely are crazy about what we're doing, right? So wouldn't you, JP Morgan, like to sponsor this? because you know, you're now going to be associated with something that is very positive and that is changing lives. And, and so these consumers that you're trying to reach, what better way to reach them than through an empowerment vehicle of this kind, right? So, so the ability to monetize it through corporate sponsorships will allow us to reduce subscription rates, which will make it more affordable. So you know, unlike the, the current model, of personal empowerment that you see out there, the Grant Cardones and and you know uh, the all the different uh, people that are you know selling self help. Um, many of those vehicles are predatory, right? You, yes. you you go, you pay a certain amount, and you get there, and it's all about the upsell, right? They're just trying to get more money out of your pocket, right? This is the exact opposite of that. This is is Let's create a really value-added formula. Let's over-deliver. And instead of monetizing it on the backs of the consumers who can least afford it, let's monetize it through corporate sponsorship, right? By doing something good and by inviting, you know, corporate America to the party, right? So that's my current project. Um, and, and the reason that I've, been, I've embarked on that is because I found that unlike you, Jake, not all young people want to read a 440 <laughs> page book, right? So, so, you know, I'm giving away free millennial samurais, you know, and, 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 and I actually have to spend money to give them away for free because <laughs> I have to advertise to get people to download this for free, right? So, so I've discovered that, that, you know, what I should have known from the beginning, I mean, it was a natural for me to do the book, but, but I really did know early on that, that this is really where I was going to reach people, right? So, so I've just, I'm now able to pivot to that and that will be, this will be the new deliver, delivery mechanism, right? And, um, and it's more well suited to your generation and uh, hopefully it'll be much more successful. Yeah, I mean, Millennial Samurai is successful, but I think Limitless is going to be very, very successful. Yeah, it sounds like Limitless is so. There's a few different parallels that are kind of running that Limitless kind of uh, culminates into. You have the, this de decaying university infrastructure that is not suitable for anyone. It's pretty much it's out of reach in terms of financing, which gives people a lot of debt. But now the generalized knowledge of the world is accessible through your smartphone or through the phone, right? You have the, right. the, the library of Alexandria pretty much in, in your hand. So you have to figure out like, where are people learning and where are people building? Well, we have this blooming creator economy, which is just right in front of us, right? You have kids who are three years old reviewing toys on YouTube for $20 million. Yeah. You have people doing podcasts and I think 10, 20 years down the road, the majority of the economy is going to be um, self-run people that are profiting off of their own brand likeliness and their creative projects. 
So Limitless kind of combines that creator economy with this new type of learning where instead of going and getting generalized knowledge, you kind of specify, but the, the people who are in Limitless, they still have their own brand and identity intact. Whereas like when you're in a classroom, every, all the students are pretty much faceless and you have to do whatever the professor says. You don't really embrace the individual, you're embracing the class as a whole. But we're in limitless, you give the the entrepreneurs, which is what all the millennials are gravitating towards, because whether it's their experience that they're looking for, or they're fighting for their life, and they have to find some sort of way to survive. It's culminating all of these different ideals and intangibles of, of the younger generation, because you've realized that universities probably aren't going to be around for much longer. Um, no one's going to pay $50,000 to take online Harvard classes when you could go get the same exact experience for free on YouTube or some of these different master classes, which are hundredth of a percent of a fraction of the price of whatever it is. So I, I like that limitless is uh, is an option. I see a lot of more people trying to do something similar with like Khan Academy is right. one. And, but there's, there's so many different unique ways to do this and it all comes back down to experience. Yeah. So Khan Academy is wonderful in terms of a educational tool. Right. So Bill Gates, you know, had his kids tutored on Khan, Khan Academy. So if you want to learn algebra or you want to learn, um, you know, uh, um, quantum mechanics, even you can do it on Khan Academy. Right. Um, but it's it, limitless is different in this respect. It, in Khan Academy, you're just learning. Right. You're just learning about these subjects. You have a you have someone who is teaching on on a video. And you're watching that video and you're you know consuming that information so so you'll have that that will be one component of limitless but take our conferences for example right you show up at a conference and there's 500 people there and they're all different ages um and uh you know predominantly younger people but many older uh, people that are interested in giving back and interested in teaching or interested in helping Right, will be the the call to action that we have that attracts uh, our community, um, and so now you go to this event, and um, you know, picture walking into a room, and there are a hundred tables, and on each of those, and they're tables of ten, right, or fifty or a hundred tables of ten, and on each of those tables, um, uh, picture a sign, right, a little uh, um, umbrella with a sign, and on that sign it might say communication or it might say creativity, or it might say depression, right? Or it might say collaboration, right? Um, there will be a hundred different topics and you'll walk in and you'll look at those tables and you'll say, well, what topic interests me? And then you'll sit down at that table with other people that want to communicate about the same thing. And there will be a facilitator. So for creativity, it might be a graphic artist, it might be a photographer, it might be, you know, uh, uh, a, a rap artist, right? Um, and they will facilitate this discussion and you'll have a 45 minute discussion about the topic, right? And, and all of these people at the table will be contributing. And at the end of that 45 minutes, the table will break and you'll look around the room and you'll say, you know what, I wanna go learn about this. And you'll walk over to that table and you'll learn about that, right? Um, at that same event, um, there will be um, uh, a, a kind of uh, networking on steroids where um, we won't just have you walk in and, and over the weekend, uh, you know, uh, you'll meet who you meet, right? We'll make sure that everyone who walks in um, has, we'll have a facilitator for a group, of, for, for groups of people. So a, a group of 10 will be assigned to facilitator A and facilitator A will be assigned to them throughout the conference. And so that group will move around and interact with other groups and exchange information, have breakout sessions where they can sit and meet each other. Um, let's say you're putting a business deal together um, and you need a graphic artist. Um, or you need an accountant, or you need a lawyer, or you need uh, somebody who can uh, program your website, right? All of those people will be at this event and, and we'll make sure that you're able to connect 
with the people that you need to connect with. So you might sit down with five different graphic artists at this conference, and now you'll be able to, you know, they'll have their laptops and they'll show you their work and you'll be able to, you know, see if there's a chemistry and a fit and you can talk about pricing. And, and you can make the kind of connections and form the relationships that are required to launch your business, right? Or you might meet with other podcasters and you might share ideas about equipment or about guests or you might uh, exchange referrals, right? Well, I had this guest, you should have them on your show. And I had this guest, you should have them on your show, right? So that kind of networking um, that is, is, is not left to chance. So, so there's a couple of big differences between limitless thinking, uh, it's limitlessthinking.com. But um, there are some fundamental differences between limitless and something like a chamber of commerce where um, you go to an event, you go to a cocktail party, you mingle and you meet who you meet. Um, it, or a Khan Academy where you go and you learn and you learn what you learn, right? But those two are very separate organizations. They're, they don't cross pollinate. You don't get all of that. Um, and here you're going to get it all, all right? And beyond that, you're going to get much more. There are other things that, that we're going to be doing that I don't want to talk about publicly right now because I don't want everybody else going out and, and, and doing you know, exactly what I'm doing. Um, but I'm putting together a very robust and very um, value added program called Limitless Thinking. And, uh, and you should you should check it out. Your viewers should check it out on limitlessthinking.com. I'll absolutely sign up for that. Something right up my alley. It reminds me yep. a little bit too of uh, kind of like an individualized Y Combinator um, yes. of, of, of sorts, but embracing the individuality of each person and representative of their own brand, because that's how, that's how we move forward in society is being able to create and profitize off ourselves, but we also want to share our knowledge with everybody. Right. And, and so as a lawyer for 30 years, I know what it takes to put a business together, right? So I know who to invite to the party. It's like creating a really cool party, right? Who do you invite to the party, right? Or, or you're going to have a dinner party and you want to have a really cool dinner party, right? Who are your guests going to be? Who are the 10 people that you're going to invite to make this incredible dinner party, right? Well, that's the way that I'm approaching Limitless is I want to invite the angel investors who can fund some of these deals. I want to invite the artistic community. I want to, I want to invite the, um, the practical skills, the accountants, the lawyers. Um, I want to invite um, the people who, have, who, who are the Sherpas, the people who have climbed Mount Everest and can show us all how to do it and can show us you know, what equipment we need and what, what uh, path to take and, and what uh, pitfalls to avoid um, and to, you know, to, to put people, especially with the way that, that, that society is trending, with the technological tsunami on the horizon that will disrupt employment, radically disrupt employment. Um, it's already been uh, disrupted um, by COVID and, and these changes to this digital economy um, and this uh, internet interface economy. Um, has been accelerated. Well, the, the tsunami of technological change of automation will further accelerate much more than COVID, um, what we're describing. And so people are going to need guidance and direction. They're going to need help. They're going to need resources um, to start these businesses. And rather than have them, you know, searching all over in a, in a jungle of predators that are trying to sell them things they don't need, um, Limitless is supposed to be an oasis in that uh, environment that, that is a true value add. And um, I believe that if you, if you, much like Capriati's, if you have a good product, if you have a truly value added product, they will come. People will yes, come, yes. right? And so you don't have to worry about much of anything other than developing a really good product, right? And then word will spread. Um, even just word of mouth will spread. Um, the best products, I mean, Capriati's did zero advertising for more than 30 years, none. It was all word of mouth. I mean, we had people that were blogging four pages long about going into one of our you know, shops for the first time and eating one of our sandwiches 
and, and they're writing four, play, four page blogs comparing it to the first time they had sex, right? The, comparing it to what they thought heroin would taste like or would be like. I mean, ridiculous types of things. We had, uh, we had uh, a ceremony where we allowed people to, to go out and rent a tuxedo and marry, the, marry their sandwich, marry their bobby, right? And, and we had 200 people go out and, and buy sandwiches and show up at a little chapel, many in tuxedos, um, to marry their sandwich, right? So we have this rabid consumer following, right? And these people tell people, right? And so that's been happening for now over 40 years. And, um, you know, it's, it's been the secret of our success. So Limitless will proceed along the same lines. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll build something that is phenomenal, that is a true value add, and we will create raving disciples. And those raving disciples will go out and sing our praise, and we will grow through that process. Global. Uh, hallelujah. Now, yeah. now, now that we peered, we peered a little bit into the future of society and the future of economy, um, as we talked about COVID kind of being an accelerant to towards um, decaying a lot of these outdated infrastructure. What do, you, what do you think happens to places like universities and commercial real estate that houses business? Do, do these just, <coughs> just, just become a ghost land? Do, do somebody come in and change it around? What, what do you think? Yeah, happens? It'll, it'll be repurposed. Um, so you'll find um, a lot of, let's say the old shopping malls, right? The, uh, the old shopping malls are going to be dinosaurs, right? The, uh, everybody's gonna be buying things online. They already are. Amazon uh, has cannibalized uh, so many American businesses that it's not even funny. Um, and that trend will only continue and it'll be global. Right, you won't just be buying from American companies, you'll be buying from global companies and you'll be buying online. And so what will happen to uh, these sprawling shopping malls? I believe they will be repurposed, right? So I believe that they will turn into something other than what they are. They could be residential uh, accommodations. They could be redesigned as, as living communities. Uh, they could be live work communities. Um, they could be experiential um, uh, centers where, where um, a form of entertainment, uh, you go in and, you know, it might be paintball, it might be virtual reality, it might be augmented reality. Um, and so you go to the Meadows Mall and, uh, you know, you can go through an escape room and you can go to a paintball thing and you can, you know, uh, go uh, test the latest uh, virtual reality gear. Um, I think that's, you know, the type of thing that we're going to see. Yeah, it, it's, it made me curious because I know the universities are just fighting for their life to, to stay relevant. And I know there's a lot of money that's generated from them and they're so tapped into the government and which is unfortunate because of those backroom deals. Like you saw a lot of these universities getting uh, bailed out for even though they don't really needed needed the bailout, like. I think I like to call Harvard as a hedge fund that's disguised as an educational system with their yeah. $20 billion endowment or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's, it's, I don't believe in bailouts. I believe, I believe in, in, in market economics. I believe in, in the free market. And I believe that there are certain necessities of life that I believe, um, you know, should be highly regulated and, and um, government should step into like healthcare um, and education. Um, but I don't believe that, that the way that we should do that is to subsidize um, antiquated models, right? I believe that government should be at the cutting edge of, of technology in terms of what it does and what it involves itself in. And so um, I'm all for government creating a free education system for, for the country or the world uh, that is an online system um, that is accessible to everyone. Um, expanding broadband, expanding access to laptops and just making it available to everyone. I am not in favor of government subsidizing sprawling campuses of big buildings um, with uh, all sorts of uh, facilities that are not even related to education, let alone uh, required for education, right? 
Um, I think that 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 uh, the private sector can, you know, if you want to go to a football game, you know, there are plenty. You go see the uh, uh, the Oakland Raiders. You don't need to um, be doing that on college campuses. I don't believe. I believe that um, we need to educate more people rather than less people. And I'd rather see us do more people for free than do a smaller number of people that we saddle with debt um, and then have them graduate and find that 50% of them, which is the number today, 50% of them can't find jobs that require a college degree. Mm -hmm. So you go to college, you, you, you take on 50 or $100,000 in debt that, that's going to mire you um, for decades right, and, and imprison you essentially and, and, and make your life that much more difficult and challenging. And, and then you graduate and you're told that you can get a job at Ann Taylor. And you say to yourself, well, shit, I could have gotten a job at Ann Taylor before <laughs> I spent four years and 50,000 or $100,000, right? So uh, you, get, you end up, 50% of the people end up with jobs that do not require a college degree. Well, if that's the job that I'm gonna end up with, you know, why did I get the college degree, right? So, so we, we need to do much better. We've got 1.5 trillion in student debt, which exceeds all credit card debt, which is ridiculous. I mean, absolutely incomprehensible to me. Um, I, I believe that, that there should be a debt jubilee. I believe that with regard to student debt, I'd like to see student debt wiped out entirely. I agree. And, and I'd like to see it, it not be repeated. I, I don't want it to be a revolving door where, you know, we're feeding these, these behemoth entities. Um, you know, what is education about? Is it about the institutions? Is it about the teachers? Or is it about the students? Right? Now, some might say it's about all three. Not to me. You know, to me, it's about those who need to be educated. That's where my focus would be. And, and, uh, but you know, who am I? I'm one guy. Right? <laughs> throughout, throughout your 30 year um, law career, and you know, from, from the inside, you made it to pretty much the top of being the attorney general. Did you, along this journey, were there any moments or experiences where you began to saw, see the, the faults and the cracks within these institutions, maybe just from an, from an insider perspective? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, Jesus. Um, well, I mean, is there any that stick out to you? Yeah. I mean, well, I'll tell you, um, I, you know, I was interested in politics since I was six years old. Um, I was in the car with my mom, came over the radio that JFK had been assassinated. My mom pulled the car out of the side of the road and started crying and, uh, you know, it left an impression on me. We went back to our little apartment. We watched the international news coverage of this fallen hero, and I became mesmerized by by politics and and by uh, the office of the presidency, and and decided that this is what this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into politics, and I wanted to pursue this this uh, same type of life. And um, and when I was in my twenty, when I was twenty, I worked on the Hill for Senator Paul Laxalt. Um, I was student body president at UNLV, and then uh, Paul Laxall came to a football game, and we sat next to each other, and uh, he invited me to come back and, and work for him in D.C. So I went back, and I worked for him, him in D.C. And when I was 20, uh, the Capitol was Mount Olympus, and senators were gods. And, and then I went back um, 20 years later, um, when I was actually 30 years later, when I was 50, and... Uh, and it was like I was in a whorehouse and, <laughs> and, and the senators were prostitutes. You know, it was just, it was just, it was night and day. My, my, my view of what I was looking at and how I perceived it and what I thought of it had, had changed so radically um, over that 30 year period. And, and during that period, I had actually gotten into politics, right? And so I had lived it. And, um, and I found it very toxic. I found it very dysfunctional. Um, I found it to be something that I just did not want to make part of my life. I felt that there was a, um, uh, an obscene level of special interest influence 
Um, I would get calls from lobbyists virtually every day. Um, I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want to meet with them. I didn't want them calling. Right? <laughs> and, and some of them would get uh, indignant, you know, like, uh, how dare he not take my call, right? And, um, you know, it, it's, a very, it's a very dysfunctional th system. You think about it. So as a lawyer, you know, for 30 years, I understood the concept of a fiduciary relationship, right? I was a fiduciary to my clients, right? Which means I owed my clients the highest duty of loyalty and fidelity under the law, recognized under the law. That's a fiduciary duty, right? So that's how I treated my clients, right? So, so then I get into politics and I realize that, that I now have 3 million clients, right? And so, and so these are, I owe all of them the same fiduciary duty, right? So I, that means, you know, generally treat them equally and generally care about all of them, right? And it doesn't mean you, you know, have to meet with all of them, but it means generally that you're not going to let any of them down and you're not going to prioritize some over others, right? And, um, and in politics, you find that special interests are very much involved on a day-to-day -day basis with the political uh, representatives that, that exist in our country. And so, and the consumer, the average voter or constituent is the exact opposite. They are totally disengaged, right? They never call, they never write. They're just, you know, they're, they just, they vote for you one day and then they forget about you and expect that you're gonna do your job, right? So then they send you off, if you're a congressman or a senator, they send you off to Washington, right? And there are 535 of you that are you know, in the Congress at wa in Washington. And that 535 of you are surrounded by lobbyists at a 20 to one ratio. So for every congressman and every United States Senator, there are at least 20 lobbyists working in Washington, DC. And these guys are on the phone or they're in your office or they're talking to your staff every day, right? And I would see this when I was working for Laxalt. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's how can you be a fiduciary to your clients, to the 3 million that are back home when, when you are completely disengaged from them and you are off thousands of miles away and you are surrounded by the agents special interests who are not looking out for the three million people that you truly represent. They're looking out for their clients, right? And, and they're trying to lobby you and persuade you um, in whatever way they can, uh, through dinners, through trips, you know, whatever, through campaign contributions to try to get you to do things and to pass laws and take votes that are in the interests of their clients, right? This is a very, very dysfunctional system. Um, in my mind, I, I, I actually, um, I really no longer believe even in representative government. I, I really don't. Um, I believe that, that we ought to have more of a direct democracy, and I believe that it should be online. And I believe that we should have a system like the one that I described to you, so that you can have a, an incredible level of participation. Um, you can empower and educate uh, the population to be more engaged and more knowledgeable. And then let's make those people, all of those engaged and educated and involved participants who are citizens, let's let them make decisions as a group, right? If you, if you read um, James Sirwicki's book on the wisdom of crowds, right? Crowds make much better decisions than individuals. Right. Um, so, so for example, if you you know you the classic beans in a jar uh, um, test, right? So you go to a state fair, there's this big jar, and it's got you know thousands of beans in it, and you guess how many beans are in the jar, right? All right. So you could take the smartest people in the world, uh, the greatest mathematicians, the greatest statisticians. Um, people who have exceptional uh, kind of perceptual abilities and, and, and take each one of those people and say, okay, uh, you 10 guys, you 10 experts, give me your, your guess on how many beans are in that jar, right? Versus take a pool of 100,000 people, average people, 
right? And have them tell you how many beans they think are in that jar and then take the average of all of those mm, people. Okay. That number will beat the other number of the experts virtually every time, right? So, so if we get better decisions through crowd um, analysis, right? Then why aren't we using that to make decisions as a country, right? Why aren't we using that to decide whether or not we should you know, eliminate the electoral college or whether or not we should expand the Supreme Court or whether or not we should give DC and Puerto Rico statehood or whether or not we should you know, uh, go into a, a war in Iraq, right? Why aren't we asking the populace um, who are going to give us better decisions? Why are we relying on these representatives, right? Half of which um, you know, are not particularly stellar people. You know, they're not the most qualified. They're not the, they're not the Bezoses. They're not the Zuckerbergs. You know, they're not the most brilliant, sharpest knives in the drawer, right? Why are we all letting them make all the decisions? Um, so, I mean, that's just, that's the way I, that's, that's what I learned from the experience. I also learned that, that in, in the law, it's a very, politics is a very dirty and, 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 to me, distasteful business. I, I got out of it as quickly as I could. Um, I, I, was, uh, um, I was appointed by Governor Gwynn. I was in for two years. I argued before the United States Supreme Court. I won 9-0. Um, I had raised five times as much money as my opponent. Um, she's now a United States Senator. She's a good friend. She was at my wedding. You know, I love her. Uh, I was at her wedding many years before. Um, I had raised five times as much money as her and I was the incumbent and I gave all the money back to the people I had raised it from and I raised money for her, my democratic opponent. I couldn't get out quickly enough. <laughs> I, I just couldn't get out quickly enough. And, and it's the best decision I ever made. I, I mean, I, it was a good decision to get in because it gave me a whole new you know, perspective that I didn't have. Um, and, and my argument before the Supreme Court was a highlight of my life, so I, I don't regret at all the decision to get in, but I don't regret for a moment the decision to get out. And you couldn't drag me back in with wild horses. <laughs> so I, I know trying to create a third party has been, it's been popular for a while. People have been craving at, at the teeth to, to get this going. I know Andrew Yang's been a big proponent of ranked choice of voting. Um, there's all these different measures around it, but we realize that the duopoly is so powerful because they're surrounded by so much money and uh, and power. Do do we are we able to bring the voting back to the populace by maybe creating some sort of centrist moderate group and then kind of prying the power away from that? Is that the easy or the the quickest way to to victory? Yeah, so, so this gets back to the impatience issue, the quickest way to victory, right? <laughs> how, do we do, how do we do this quickly, right? Because we're running out of time because the world is going to explode, so we need to do it <laughs> soon, right? Um, which, you know, may be true, and, and, and maybe that is the mindset that we need, is that, you know, uh, speed to market is critical, right? So let's, let's get this happening immediately. First of all, I don't think anything is easy. I think that um, all good things require time and effort. And, and so I believe that we need some fundamental structural changes to occur in this country in certain areas. One of those areas is politics. Another area might be healthcare, another, not might be, another area is healthcare. Another area is education, right? Uh, another area is military spending and, and procurement and, and, and the focus of our military, right? Why are we building battleships anymore? Right when the world is uh, the next world war will be fought on laptops, right, and with drones and 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 advanced technology, and and so we need to retool. We need to pivot, and we need to retool. And so um, number one, understand that. Understand that you need to make that your generation and and Gen Z and alphas are going to need to completely retool and restructure some major segments of society that are long overdue for improvement and redesign and reinvention, right? So begin with that understanding that, that, that you've got a big task. You're not going to complete it in your lifetime, all of it, but you can begin it. 
and you can start to tackle some of these problems. And then Gen Z is going to pick up where you left off and alphas are going to pick up where they, where they left off and, and on it goes, right? So, so, so first of all, begin with that understanding. Secondly, um, the, you know, as Harari points out in Sapiens, there's this social fabric that is required for human beings to collaborate and cooperate, right? So if you're gonna run a business, right? If I'm running a business, if I'm forming a business, the one thing that I'm not gonna do, Jake, is I'm not gonna create two divisions that are in competition with each other in a blood sport to undermine each other so that only one will succeed and become the dominant power, which is what we are seeing in politics today, right? It's, it's a winner take all system, right? So if you're a Democrat, you never wanna you know, applaud or, or help or facilitate what the Republicans are doing because God forbid they get any credit for the success that you jointly you know, created, uh, that could diminish your chances of winning. You'd much better, you're, you're much better off under the current system stabbing them in the back, making them look like fools, making them look like idiots and making them fail and saying, I'm the only guy in town who can solve your problems. I'm the only party that, that can help you, right? Which is what we have today. That needs to end. That has to end. So, so the first thing is, is the public coming to grips with the reality that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. Right, so, so just because you see it a certain way, just because your software and your brain is telling you that this is truth and that this is reality does not mean that it is reality and does not mean that it is truth, right? So, so understand your own vulnerability, understand your own inadequacy, understand your own fallibility. We all need to do that, okay? Once we do that, and once we realize that, you know, hey, I don't have Jake's perspective, that could be valuable to me because I don't have it, right? I want a 365 degree helicopter perspective of, of a problem. That's how I've been solving complex problems for 30 years is I've used a helicopter perspective, right? I've tried to see everything from all angles, right? Not just what does my client think, but what does the opposition think? What do the constituencies of my client and the opposition think? What do industry players uh, that may impact what we're doing think? What does everybody think? What is the judge going to think, right? How do I get an overview of the truth? How do I arrive at the truth? That's how you solve complex problems. That's how you move forward as a nation. And, and when you recognize that, that everyone's software is different and everybody's prism is different and everybody's perspective is different. And, in, and you begin to see that as an asset as opposed to a liability. You begin to see alternative perspectives as an asset. And then you, you want those perspectives because they inform your decisions, right? Then you start talking, then you start collaborating, then you start reaching out then you start opening your mind, then you start listening, right? So this is the path forward. The path forward is to recognize that you don't know everything. I don't know everything. No one knows everything. We're wrong half the time, right? And, and so, you know, if we're all wrong half the time, then, then, then we're all right half the time, right? If we disagree, look at the world's issues that we confront. Half the people go one way, half the other people go go the other way. On any given day, on any given choice, somebody's wrong, right? And somebody's right. It, it, there's not a thousand percent batting average for Democrats and there's not a thousand percent batting average for Republicans, right? So cherry pick, learn to cherry pick, learn discernment, learn critical thinking, learn to have an open mind, learn to listen, right? And then cherry pick the best ideas from both sides, right? And then once you have that mindset, if everybody had that mindset, we would have no problems. We would work together. We would, the best ideas would emerge and we would jointly pursue those best ideas. Instead, today, what do we have? We have one administration comes in, Obama builds o Obamacare. Trump dismantles it. Trump builds a wall. The next group may dismantle it, right? 
this is not how you run a business. This is not how you run a government, right? This is, this is the, the uh, recipe for disaster. This is dysfunction, the textbook definition of dysfunction, right? This is why uh, today uh, um, uh, our confidence in, in, in government and the media is measured in the single digits, the lowest levels in the 40, 50 year history of the Gallup poll, right? So, so there's a reason why people don't trust their government. There's a reason why people don't trust the media because they are underperforming. They are not doing what is expected of them. They are not doing a good job. I wouldn't hire some of these people to walk my dog. I mean, it's ridiculous. It yeah. really is. Where this is this whole conversation is coming full circle to the book. I absolutely love everything about that. I think the glaring ideal that I had or thought during that conversation was the way that we get back power is through finances and through Bitcoin. I'm sure all my listeners knew I was going to throw that out there, but if you're able to, so I think one of the major issues in society is that the government, we've already acknowledged that the government and the politicians are in bed with the special interest groups. And even the, the most recent stimulus package I, it highlighted it to like magnitudes through all the different hundreds and billions of dollars through all these different various areas. So if we can get off of this, this US dollar system, because the government's obviously controlling it, they're inflating it. And so the, the bottom half of society or the US doesn't own any assets. So their purchasing power decreases while the people who own the assets get richer. So, and then on top of that, they're bailing out the different corporations and they're giving the people $600 or when Biden comes in, they're going to print $2,000, which is only a temporary brand aid to make the situation worse, in my opinion. Um, so if, if we're able to find some sort of currency that's outside of government control, um, that's why I've been such a Bitcoin fanatic, as you see places like Venezuela and Brazil and a lot of these yeah. nations where their, their money has gotten away from them. And they're basically like protesting the government. That's how I see it. If you hate the yeah. system, opt out of the system. <laughs> And that's why we see such a, such a rise in it. And I think that that's only one tool in order to get society back on the same page. And when you talked about um, decentralized blockchain voting, where my, the millennial generation, we're really focused on transparency because the, the generations above haven't really been transparent with us, you know, for the most part. I mean, you've been, you've been very transparent, but a lot of the people who've been holding the power aren't transparent. So we've been kind of boxed out of society. So we're trying to create all these transparent layers where there's no single attack vector that we can uh, re retool and rebuild the different infrastructure within society. So I think we're, we are though at the beginning of this, this revolution in order to, to get back power to the people. Yeah, well, Bitcoin is a fascinating concept, and it's uh, especially right now. It's very timely because it's it's doubled, you know, recently. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm involved in to a small degree. Um, I've got some, you know, cryptocurrency, um, but uh, I haven't made a a bold transition uh, into crypto um, because it's it's very volatile and it's very yes. uncertain. And um, I believe that blockchain has an immense future, um, but blockchain goes way beyond currency, right? So a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, you can run cities on blockchain. You can yeah, run Ethereum. You know, immigration systems. You can run electoral systems on blockchain. So um, blockchain is here to stay and blockchain is going to be um, a magnificent uh, benefit to society um, without question. That's blockchain. Bitcoin, is a particular coin. It, it's not even crypto, it's, it's, it's Bitcoin, right? So crypto is also going to have a profound impact on society globally, right? Now, then we get down to what about Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin is, is, is like a Cadillac or Mercedes or, you know, it, it's a particular vehicle, right? It's a product. And, and so the question is, um, you know, is this going to be the, uh, what is going to be the, uh, 
currency of choice, right? Is it going to be Bitcoin or is it going to be something else, right? So Ethereum has more functionality than Bitcoin, right? More utility, right? Bitcoin is strictly a currency, whereas Ethereum is a tool. Like smart um, contracts. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and then Ethereum 2.0, which is coming out, is going, is going to have even more uh, utility, right? And then some kid in his garage is going to come out with, you know, um, you know, sliver, right? <laughs> or, or whatever, right? And, and God knows what it'll do, right? And so what worries me about investing in something like Bitcoin worries me personally. And I don't want to give any investment advice mm -hmm. to anybody. And I don't want anybody following uh, what they think is my, you know, play on cryptocurrency, because uh, um, that makes me nervous, right? <laughs> I, I don't know what to do myself, let alone advise others on this subject. So uh, no investment advice here and no legal <laughs> advice, just, you know, some thoughts of, uh, you know, 62 year old guy who's been around the block. Um, the, uh, um, the, uh, I would be in cryptocurrency personally. I am in it a little bit, um, but I would be very, very careful. I would not be putting anything in it that I can't afford to lose. Um, and I would watch it closely. I would learn about it. Uh, it is definitely an area that you should be learning about, right? So the more you know about it, the better off you're going to be right? Because you're going to see opportunities that are going to come along because you're watching it. And, and when those opportunities come along, over time, you will have developed enough of a knowledge base to be able to know where you want to place your bets, right? But they are very much going to be bets, like bets on the stock market, like investing in an Amazon, right? Or an Apple, um, or, you know, many companies that, uh, you know, MySpace, right, was all the rage, right, and now it's gone, right? Betamax was all the rage and now it's gone, right? So you have to anticipate that as well, which means you want to be diversified. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? Which means also if, if diversification is a proven, tested philosophy, which I believe it is, um, you know, historically for, for generations, uh, diversification has always been uh, an advised uh, investment strategy. Um, I would not have all my eggs in the dollar basket, and I would not have all my eggs in the, in, in the uh, Bitcoin basket. Um, I would have a diversified, far, diversified portfolio. I would have land. I would have a business. I would invest in myself and build yes. my business. Um, I would have a diverse portfolio of, of currencies, um, crypto and non-crypto, um, and I would, uh, I would just try to be as, as uh, diversified as possible and as astute as possible in placing my bets. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. When when you're um, just beginning, it is very dense. I always advise everyone who approaches me about crypto to put 10 to 50 dollars in the beginning and then once you have skin in the game you begin to understand what questions to ask because they try to ask me about it just point blank and i'm like we could sit here for three hours and you probably won't understand it in the beginning but but diversifying is smart and there was there was one topic that you discussed at the end of your book about asteroid mining right and mining yeah. all of these different minerals and one of the things that that worries me on on the outside of Bitcoin, it's like, okay, if these companies come in and they can mine gold and silver and platinum and a bunch of these earth metals, then they bring it back to earth. It creates a big, a larger abundance, which would therefore devalue everything on earth. So, so that situation has worried me. That's why I, I try to hodl a lot mm -hmm. of my money in Bitcoin because it's a scarce asset and we believe that it's gonna be the, the digital or the internet money or the money of the internet. But when they can mine asteroids and bring a bunch of these metals back, it makes me believe that these metals are going to be used more for utility than for a valuation metric. Well, that's probably true. Um, asteroid mining is going to be big business, and there's going to be a lot of it. Um, and uh, in fact, I was just watching a, a, a sci-fi film. Um, I, I forget the name of it, um, but I think it's on... 
Babe, do you remember the name of that sci fi? Expanse. It's, dude, the greatest, the greatest sci fi movie ever, or TV series. Yeah. Fifth, uh, season yeah. five's out right now. Yeah. My favorite, yeah. absolute favorite. Yeah. So, so, you know, they've got Earth and they've got the belt, the asteroid belt, and then mm. they've got Mars, right? So, I mean, they're, they're, even in this, they're, they are showing how significant the asteroid belt is, right? So there are roughly 5,000 mineable asteroids that are uh, um, within reach and mineable. And you've got guys like Larry Page and Eric Schmidt of Google um, who are financing and raising money for a company called Planetary Resources, right? So to me, Planetary Resources, learning about a company like Planetary Resources, you learn about these things in Millennial Samurai. If you read Millennial Samurai, you learn about these things. And, and what's the benefit of knowing about that? Well, you know, if I had told you about Coca-Cola, you know, back when it was beginning, um, you'd have done very well to have known about it. And when you saw it hit the stock market, invest in it, right? Well, when I see an asteroid mining company that Larry Page and Eric Schmidt of Google are investing in, and this thing goes public, I'm gonna get a piece of it, right? And, and so um, what's interesting about asteroid mining is not only that you know, they've, uh, they've identified an asteroid called Davida, which they believe has $100 trillion worth of precious metals, um, which is more valuable than the global GDP. The global GDP is about 80 trillion. The US GDP is around 20 trillion. And here's an asteroid, a single asteroid of which there are 5,000 asteroids. And this one has $100 trillion worth of precious metals. Um, so they're clearly gonna be mining it for those precious metals. But what's really fascinating about asteroid mining is that the minerals are not the most valuable thing on the asteroid. The most valuable thing on the asteroid is water. And the reason that that's the most valuable thing is because rocket fuel, all of NASA's 135 missions have been fueled by hydrogen and oxygen, right? So you can take water and you can create rocket fuel out of water, right? Now, Gravity is such that if I want to uh, take a, a spaceship up to the moon or up to an asteroid, and I want to carry um, rocket fuel with me, right? I need 10 tons of rocket fuel to burn in order to carry one ton of rocket fuel out of Earth's gravity, right? So, so this creates a huge limitation on deep space exploration because you can't bring enough fuel up for the journey forward, right? Um, but if you can create that fuel in space, then you can take the rocket up to the asteroid or to the moon or to whatever, and you can you know, refuel there uh, because you found water, which you've converted into rocket fuel, and you can refuel there, and now you no longer are encumbered by Earth's gravity, and now the rocket fuel that you've refueled on the asteroid can take you as far as Mars or Jupiter, right? Because you don't have the resistance of gravity. So, so that's what's most valuable. Interesting. Because it enables outer space colonization, right? So, so you know, some people say, well, asteroid mining. Um, I had one guy telling me that, you know, uh, I know about mining, right? I'm from Nevada. I know about mining. And it costs so much money to mine. <laughs> You know, and when you add on top of that, all of the, you know, space exploration and the rocket ships, you know, why would you ever go to an asteroid to get gold when you can just dig it out of Nevada, right? Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, there's not a hundred trillion dollars worth of, uh, of, of uh, gold and platinum and, and all these precious minerals in one uh, 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 dense space. So, you know, to, to, to mine that equivalent, you'd have to, on Earth, you'd have to set up thousands of mines all over the world, number one. Number two, it's not about the, it's not about the metal. It's about the water, you know? That's the real value. Um, and, and so, anyway, I think asteroid mining has a huge future. Um, and uh, Expanse kind of bears me out on this. Uh, the, the creators of that film you know, clearly feel the same way. 
Yeah, Ex- Expanse is my absolute favorite sci-fi TV series. I've actually read a few of the books. The books are actually like four or five seasons ahead of the TV show within itself, but I, it hits such a realistic standpoint of how humans evolve, whereas like Mars or uh, yeah, Mars has become this military superpower and it's kind of like a breakaway nation and the Earth, everyone's finally band together on Earth and it's the... I forget the thing called the earth nations or something like that. And how yeah. you, you have the, the outliers who live on like these outer planets and then they just, they're just hated, hated and felt like they've um, been forgotten about. Oh, it's, it's such a good show. Yeah. And, and the Mars, the Mars community are all the cool hip Elon Musk cutting yeah. kind of forward thinkers. And, and they look down on the earth as sort of, you know, you guys kind of messed everything up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, what do you know? Right. Almost like, uh, um, uh, what's the uh, the saying about boomers? Um, uh, okay, boomer. Okay, right? boomer. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, boomer. <laughs> like uh, um, yeah. so, the Mars the Mars crew is sort of like the millennials, and and Earth crew is sort of like the boomers. The boomers. Yeah, it's like uh, Mars has been kind of privatized, <laughs> and then the public sector is still on on Earth, and then they're going through this constant battle because the entrepreneurs are like, dude, we're out of here. Like, yeah, we have, we have more opportunity. It is interesting to see what laws will. Um, form on Mars. Once that happens, uh, Elon Musk jokingly said that he's going to create his own laws, which kind of got some backlash. But it's like, if you're not there to regulate it, like it's the first mover effect, like yeah. you're there and it just kind of translates outwards. Yeah. I just, uh, uh, my wife and I, we just bought a piece of property up in Idaho, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And it's the first city in the country to give robots all the rights of humans to treat them as people. Right, so so you you can kidnap a robot in Coeur d'Alene. Um, you know, if you steal a robot, it's kidnapping. Um, so interesting. It, I didn't hear that. Yeah, it's interesting how these laws will evolve. Yeah, with with the way that we can implement. Well, if uh, Neuralink pans out to be what it is, and you know, we are. Uh, have you read a uh, Homo Deus by Yuval Harari as well? I have, I have not read that yet. I'm uh, familiar with it. Uh, it's such a good book. And he talks about like how right now kind of we're part cyborg, but in the future, like we're part cyborg now because our mind is so attached to the phone that we spend almost half of our time, sometimes even more on there. So we're already living digitally, but in the future, we're either going to go two different directions where either our mind is uploaded and you're living in a cyborg way there where then you can control some sort of robotic body or we get these robotic limbs which are already starting to surface in society already and is making a lot of progress so it's interesting to see how you regulate that because it's like okay what if somebody has two robotic prosthetic limbs and then you get in a fight with them and you chop off the robotic limb is that considered assault even though it's not directly tied to them like all these laws have to continually evolve yeah time absolutely um, it's, 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 it's beyond comprehension. Um, the, the human brain is, is limited in its capacity to understand, envision, or imagine um, certain things that are beyond our, our, our cognitive ability. So for example, uh, Ray Kurzweil at Google, head of AI for Google, talks about the singularity, right? He talks about when I first started reading Kurzweil, he was saying that it was going to happen in 2045. He's now saying it's going to happen as early as 2029, which is nine years away. And I just heard Elon Musk say he thinks it's going to happen in less than five years. So so Stephen Hawking called this the greatest event in human history before he died in 2014. The singularity when machine intelligence eclipses human intelligence would be the greatest event in human history, greater than fire, greater than the wheel, greater than the internet, greater than space travel, greater than anything that man has ever conceived or developed, right? So Musk telling us five years, Kurzweil telling us nine to 10 years, it's coming. It's coming like a freight train and it's coming during our lifetime. That's a certainty, okay? It's coming. So, so now beyond that, Musk, or, uh, uh, Kurzweil goes on to say that once it happens, once it happens and it becomes more intelligent and self-learning than, than human beings, that it will increase at an exponential rate where, um, where 
20 years later, 10 to 20 years later, it will be not our equal. It will be a billion times, a billion times with a B, more capable than human intelligence. We, our brains lack the capacity to even imagine what a, a life form or an intelligence that is a billion times more intelligent than us, what that means, right? We don't, we don't know what that, what that could mean, right? Um, what it could be capable of. But there are, you know, he also talks about our neural cortex being connected to the cloud when this happens or before this happens, where, you know, when I was a kid, I'd get on my bike, go to the library. You're a kid, you pick up your phone. The next kid is just going to think about a question and the answer is going to come to them instantaneously. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's just a quantum leap in, in um, possibilities, in, in where this may all go. And um, so anyway, um, and then they talk about longevity escape velocity. There's a guy, um, Aubrey de Grey, hold on, Aubrey de Grey of the SENS Research Foundation says that the first person who will live to a thousand is alive today. Wow. Meaning that a baby born today, that, that, that technology and advances in longevity research over the next 90 to 100 years, the life of that child will, will increase to the point that, that lifespans will increase from an average of 100 years to an average of 1,000 years. Okay, So now let's say they're wrong. Let's say that it's not a thousand years. Let's say it's 500 years. Let's say it's 200 years, right? That's still like a ridiculous um, change. Um, and then there's, you know, Kurzweil talks about longevity escape velocity. And what he says is basically today, for every year that passes, science ad has advanced to the point where you are not, you are losing, uh, um, you are losing lifespan every year. Right, because technology has not evolved to the point where um, it, it's yet able to reverse that <coughs> equation. But in 10 years, Kurzweil says, we will hit longevity escape velocity, which means that for every additional year that you live, you will gain more than a year in increased lifespan. And so, so instead of losing a year every year, every passing year, um, you're, you're not losing a full year. And, and then at some point, you know, uh, maybe you're gaining you know, every year and uh, to the point where you know, lifespans are radically enhanced. So all of these changes, I mean, one of the things that I don't think many people realize is that, because I didn't realize any of this and still, until I started looking at it about 10 years ago, so about 10 years ago, I started reading about all this and, um, and looking into the future. And, and what I saw was absolutely remarkable. It was astounding to me. And, and so um, that you know, kind of set me on this journey of, of writing about these things and talking about these things and, and learning more about these things. Um, and I don't think that the general public by and large knows uh, a fraction of what mm -hmm. we, we've been discussing today. So the people that are watching your show are actually, you know, learning something that the vast majority of the public doesn't know. Yeah, yeah I, I hope that everyone that's listening and, and if they've made it this far, it's incredibly enlightening um, conversation. I know it has been for me. This is a conversation exactly that I wanted, and we got to touch on a lot of a lot of different sections of the book. But there's still probably about 160 different topics that we didn't cover. So yeah. uh, be, before we do get out of here. Um, I always ask my guests the same question on the way out. Uh, the one question is, what does Las Vegas mean to you? Everything. <laughs> I mean, Las Vegas, um, uh, Las Vegas is where I've lived the majority of my life. Um, it's created incredible opportunities for me. It's given me incredible me uh, memories. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, all of my relationships, my, my wife, my daughter, um, my nieces and nephews, um, they're all here. And, um, and Las Vegas is an iconic city. It's a, it's a city of, of endless possibilities. And um, that's what it means to me. It, it really means of new beginnings and endless possibilities. 
Um, there's, so, there's so much opportunity here. Um, and I, I'm concerned about, you know, COVID's impact on the hotels and, and, and on employment and, and uh, you know, what social distancing and, and uh, um, the precautions that we've all had to take, uh, sheltering in place, all of this, how this has impacted our hotels and casinos. And, um, you know, there's even a possibility that some of them will fail. And, um, but they will be reborn. Right, you know, even if they go into bankruptcy, even if they fail, someone will buy them out of bankruptcy post COVID and someone will, you know, reignite the flame and, and keep the torch burning and, and move everything forward. And uh, it will evolve. I mean, we, we are a, an entertainment destination. We're, an, we're, we're going to become an experiential destination. Uh, the um, Sheldon Adelson and uh, the Venetian are building this dome. Uh, that is this experiential dome that is going to be, you know, incredible. Um, there is a, uh, um, what's his name? Oh, he was with uh, Jane's Addiction. Um, and he did Lollapalooza. Jesus uh, Christ. Um... His name escapes me at the moment. Perry Farrell. Perry Farrell is doing uh, a project with Caesar's Palace um, that is going to be very, very uh, interesting um, and futuristic and experiential. Um, so there's all sorts of really cool things uh, that are coming. Um, you know, Cirque du Soleil, unfortunately, magnificent institution closed as a consequence of, of COVID, but it will come back or something like it will come back or something better will come back. And, um, and that's what Vegas will be. And, and that's what Vegas means to me. Yeah, Vegas is very good at being on the cutting edge of whatever we need to do. Yeah. Uh, for, for everyone who's either watching or listening, where do I send them if they want to learn more about you or any of your endeavors? Okay, so um, the best place to find out more about me and everything that I'm doing is George J, middle initial J as in James, Chanos. So George J Chanos, C-H-A-N-O-S at G, uh, um, dot com. Uh, so just go to georgejchanos.com and you'll find links to millennialsamurai.com and you'll find links to limitlessthinking.com and you'll find my books and you'll find the free download and uh, you'll learn, you know, I'll post there what I'm doing and what's new and what's happening. And, and um, that's probably the best way to, to, to uh, reach me. If you, uh, if you want to contact me directly, you can uh, email me at gj gjchanos.com or gjchanos at gmail.com uh, perfect i'll be sure to link all of that below yeah guys if you enjoyed this conversation his book is so much deeper and denser there's a lot of knowledge in there and i advise you to join me on uh, limitless because i'll be hopping on that bandwagon as well so george thank you for uh, for coming on i appreciate you um, especially everything that you're doing for the younger generation and uh, sharing your insight and knowledge that you've attained along your way well, thank you, Jake. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, interact with you and your audience, meet you. Um, I'm impressed by what you're doing and want to say congratulations and thank you to you as well. I think that you're, you know, you're adding knowledge to people's lives and, and you're helping empower others. And that's, you know, there's, there's not much you could be doing that's better than that. And so stick with it. Um, I expect this to be uh, an even bigger and better and more, um, you know, broadly watched podcast. I'm going to, I'm going to check back with you and I'm sure that over time uh, right. it's just going to grow exponentially. Yes. I appreciate you for that, for those comments We're working very hard. Um, we're all in this together and when we're collabing, we all succeed. So thank Absolutely. you again. And uh, thank you guys for listening. I'll catch you next time.